Yeah, how can we acknowledge uh, some of our white coats in the area and uh, worked out that I was able to come down and so I'm happy, thankful for the Sabbath School teachers and members who didn't mind a little uh, disruption uh, in the schedule. Uh, I'm Bill Port and I'm Assistant Director of Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries for the North American Division. Uh, so we work with all of our chaplains, 713 Seventh-day Adventist chaplains in healthcare, uh, 103 in the military, um, uh, uh, chaplains in police, fire, uh, colleges, secret service, NASCAR, all of these different areas where we have Seventh-day Adventist pastors serving uh, as chaplains in special mm -hmm. settings. We also work with our military members uh, and support them, uh, there for them. Uh, I am one of four regional directors. I live in Houston, so not too terribly far away. And I cover the whole central US, Southwestern Union Conference and Mid-America Union Conference. And for myself, I had some about a dozen years in full-time public campus ministry and 20 years as an army chaplain. Just finished uh, in February of this year uh, with the Army Reserve. But my interest in working with white coats, and we're going to tell you a little bit more of that, that was a special program that many of our Seventh-day Adventist medics during the Vietnam era were involved in. 2,300 Seventh-day Adventist medics volunteered for this special program that the Army had looking at defenses against germ warfare. And they realized that they needed human subjects to work with. And these men volunteered to be willing to receive whatever tests that the Army wanted to give them. And for me, as I say, my interest started one day when my daughter gave me a call. Amy graduated from Andrews University a few years back, degrees in animal science, with a minor in chemistry, and a degree in France uh, or in French. She spent a year at Cologne in France. She did a year with Adra in Madagascar, worked at the Andrews University of Dairy in Madagascar. She was looking at keeping ways, uh, helping uh, keep diseases spread from humans and animals back and forth. And now she was a graduate student at Texas A&M University in veterinary public health and epidemiology. And in her first epidemiology class where they studied diseases, she got a dis assigned a disease to research something called Q fever. And she started reading this book about Q fever and it suddenly talks about all these studies done with white coats. And she calls me up, she says, Dad, have you ever heard of this operation white coat? I said, now you know what I do for the church, what do you think? <laughs> and so she, uh, I was able to give her, there was a book that was written by uh, a couple of Seventh-day Adventists for God and Country Bob Mole, who was a Navy chaplain in Vietnam, and his brother Dale Mole, who was a doctor, together wrote the one book that's been written about white coats, both the history of the project and then all of the different research studies that the Army published on so many different diseases and procedures as a result of the studies that they did. A couple of years ago, a Air Force researcher by the name of Randy Larson found out about this and he decided to make a documentary called Operation White Coat. And we recently uh, sent that to all the white coats. We uh, sent it to every church and to every pastor. So you might have a copy of it hanging around somewhere. I brought a copy and guess what? We're having technical difficulties. So I'm gonna have to give you my version of a presentation that I've given on it rather than see the video. But. Bob's got a copy of the video, and maybe you can see that another time. It's only about 35 minutes long. Uh, but it was interesting that this documentary was produced by somebody who was not an Adventist, but was really fell in love with this story. And I got to know him. He lives in Austin, Texas, so I went over and had dinner with him uh, and found out more about it and found out he was going to have a preliminary showing of it at Texas A&M, at the vet school where my daughter's a student because one of the professors at the vet school, Dr. Jerry Parker, was the former commander of USAMRA, the US Army's Research Institute for Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland, the very place these guys spent their time. 
Well, we ended up having that showing, and it was sponsored by both the Vet School and Adventist Christian Fellowship, our student organization of which my daughter was the president that year. And we had probably about 200 people that came out to see that movie. We were just blown away. My daughter introduced the program, we watched the movie, and then we had a panel discussion. Dr. Jerry Parker moderated. I was there to talk about Adventist history. Uh, the filmmaker was there, and a couple of researchers who still do research in these kinds of diseases were able to share theirs. Um, germ warfare is not one of those things that we talk about. It's kind of one of those scary subjects. And that's what these guys were called to uh, get involved in, to help this battle during the Cold War. I could go into a lot of the preliminary history. You know, it's not, it wasn't just a new thing that people thought that maybe we can use germs in warfare. You know, that goes back to the, mid, the Middle Ages when people would take diseased sheep and use catapults and throw them over the walls of a disease of a city that was under siege in hopes that everybody would get sick, or the Romans would throw dead cows into wells to contaminate them. World War I, the Germans started using anthrax and glanders and cholera and the plague as part of their warfare. So after World War I, the Geneva Conventions banned it, said no country should do it. An American uh, major wrote an article saying, you know, it's really impractical what we know about diseases, these diseases, except maybe anthrax, we could probably use that using spores, that would probably be effective. And after 9-11, we found out that it was when we had the anthrax uh, attacks in DC. He said, plague would probably work. We can just drop rats carrying plague fleas on a city and they'll help spread that. But he said, other than that, it's really not gonna work in warfare. <laughs> There was a Japanese doctor who read that article, and he didn't take it as something to discourage him. He saw it as inspiration. And Major Shiro Ishii, he started what was called Unit 731 in China. And he started using various diseases on prisoners of war, on Chinese prisoners, on other prisoners. And he was interviewed later and he says, I didn't care what happened to them. They were just lab rats to me, these human beings. And he killed them afterwards or if they died, he didn't care. He treated them no different than guinea pigs. After the war, the US was very interested in what some of these scientists did on our, of our enemies. They took people like German rocket scientists <coughs> Werner von Braun, one of those, those of us who are, got some gray hairs, remember him from NASA days. Nazi rocket scientist who invented the V-2, who used US servicemen, POWs, as slave labor. We had no problem bringing him to the US to develop our rocket program. US also went to make sure that Ishii did not go to a prisoner of war camp. They wanted his research. They protected his research. And then they got to the point, they said, well, we need to further this research somehow. We need to be able to protect against it. But we can't do to people what he did. We've got some moral restraints that are gonna keep us from ever subjecting people to those kinds of harms. And we had these things called the Nuremberg Protocols developed in 1947 that said, if we're gonna do experiments involving any human beings, we have to be very careful that it's ethical. There must be informed consent. They must know what they're getting into. They have to know fully what the risks are. They have to be able to say no at any point. There has to be a valid research. We can't just wonder, like Hitler did, oh, how many times can we break a kid's bone before it won't heal anymore? We can't just do that sadistic stuff. There has to be a valid medical purpose for any experiments that we do. And so we lined up these protocols and the White House put out a memorandum saying, yes, we want to do this research, but we're gonna do it ethically. And that's one of the great things that stands out about the White Coat Project is that at every step they adhered to those Nuremberg protocols. The Army was insistent that they would not violate those. 
And so at each step, the volunteers were told, this is a program you can enter into voluntarily. This is what we're going to do. This is the purpose. And they would say yes at that point. Then before they got a specific shot, whether it was a disease, whether it was a vaccine, or maybe it was a placebo that they were getting. There was control groups that didn't get anything. At each point, they were told, this is what you could be getting. This is what could happen to you. Do you want to do it or not? So every step along the way, they were able to say no, and they were taken care of. Compare that to something else that was happening at the same time in Tuskegee from the US Public Health Service. They were doing experiments on syphilis, and they didn't tell the people what was happening. They let countless numbers of African-American men go with syphilis untreated and exposed it to their family because they didn't tell them what they had. And that went on for decades without anybody being told. And there were treatments. They could have fixed it with a penicillin shot. But the US Public Health Service took one route and the Army, thank God, took a very different route. So now how does the Seventh-day Adventist Church get involved in this? Well, there was a army doctor in October 1954. I gotta hold this up, it's small print. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel William Tiggert wrote to Dr. Theodore Flair, the secretary of the medical department at the General Conference. And, Dr. and Colonel Tiggert told him, he says, hey, I was just at this conference at Loma Linda University and I learned about the Seventh-day Adventist Church's commitment to health. And I also learned that you have an awful lot of medics. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church has always believed in non-combatancy. Starting from the time we were founded as a church in 1863, when the draft, first draft law came out, we said, hey, we want to be considered like one of those churches, like the Anabaptists, the Mennonites, the Quakers were opposed to war. We want to serve. We'll run hospitals. We'll take care of freed slaves. Uh, we'll uh, run stretchers back and forth on the battlefield, but just don't require us to carry weapons. And the government responded. So Seventh-day Adventists, by 1954, had established a track record. And of course, during World War II, we had Desmond Doss, the first non-combatant, get the Medal of Honor because of his heroism shown at Hacksaw Ridge in the Battle of Okinawa, where he saved over 75 soldiers lowering them one by one by one over this cliff as demonstrated in Mel Gibson's movie a few years ago, Hacksaw Ridge. So Seventh-day Adventists were known as people who loved their country. They said, as Desmond Doss says in that movie, consider us not conscientious objectors, but conscientious cooperators. We want to help wherever we can. And so Tigger got this idea. He said, we've got so many Seventh-day Adventists coming through the medic training program at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. What if we ask them to volunteer? Because as a lifestyle group, they're a little different than everybody else. All good Seventh-day Adventists don't smoke, don't drink, don't do any of these bad things. A friend of mine said when he got to the White Coast, he was the only one in his group who didn't smoke and drink. <laughs> Kids are the same of any age. <laughs> uh, but they said, here's a, here's a group that doesn't have a lot of the risks that the general population has. And maybe they might be willing to volunteer for this. Now, if I'd gotten a letter like that from the Army, or if my boss got a letter like that, we would be a lot more skeptical. But you know, the General Conference only studied that for about three weeks before they wrote back and said, Sure, this sounds like a great idea, the great way that we can help and show our devotion to the country. So starting with that and going up through 1973, the end of the draft, every time a group of medics graduated from AIT, Advanced Individual Training, at Fort Sam Houston, a representative of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and a representative from this program would go to Fort Sam and pull aside the Adventist medics and tell them the program. And would you like to volunteer? And then of those volunteers, they weeded them out, interviewed, and selected a proportion of those. 
and they ended up at Fort Detrick, Maryland, or some of them lived at Forest Glen by Walter Reed, and some of them never did do any of these trials. And I think that's true of all three white coats that we have here today, never got exposed to the disease. Some did. Uh, some were control groups and they got a placebo. Some worked in clerical roles supporting the program. But until 1973, this program went on. 1969, some people started raising some questions. There were articles, 60 Minutes did an expose. Uh, uh, New York Times, I think, did an article. Uh, there were articles in an independent Adventist publication, Spectrum, saying, oh no, this is all about offensive germ warfare, and they're trying to create diseases, and white coats are dying from this. And so the church did an investigation. They sent a committee to Fort Detrick to uh, meet with the leaders to see the reports, see what they were doing, and a guy named Neil Wilson was the chair of that committee, later general conference president and father of our current general conference president. And they were convinced that all of these scandals being alleged were not true, that our folks were being treated well. And Bob mentioned Dr. Frank DiMazzo, who was a surgeon there. He was a MASH doctor in uh, uh, the Korean War. Uh, Frank has an amazing story. He's in his 90s now. He did surgery at the hospital in Frederick, Maryland until he was in his 80s. He was still doing surgeries. He is a living institution. And you'll find lots of buildings named after him on our Seventh-day Adventist College campuses. My daughter lived in DeMazzo Hall at Andrews University, so he's a great philanthropist to the church. But during the Korean War, he was both a doctor of POWs and then he was in a MASH unit. And he came back after Korea to Frederick, and here's Fort Detrick. And as a veteran himself, he says, I want to take care of these uh, veteran, these Adventist servicemen. So he was, he, ran, he and his wife ran the National Service Organization, the support, having uh, all these service members over to their house, taking care of them. And then in the years afterwards, DeMaza's interest was working with the researchers to do follow-up studies of the white coats. Did anything happen to them? Were they negatively affected by it? And I've been to Fort Detrick. I've sat with the current commander. I've been given the grand tour of all the research facilities and talked to people there. And they did follow-up studies. They did a survey of all the medics and they said, give us your health history. What kind of things have happened to you? What's your health look like since you participated in the program? Then they went into their file to see, okay, what diseases, if any, were they exposed to? And they couldn't find any major negative consequences. The only correlations that they could find was some people who were exposed to a placebo in some tests where it was just the, the aerosol agent that they were given, uh, not even a disease, just the aerosol, caused some of them in later years to have a higher incidence of asthma. And some people who got a, a rabbit fever had a higher incidence of headaches. That was it. Those were the only correlations they could find between anybody's exposure and their health afterwards. So it was really a positive thing, saying, yes, these guys were treated right, and all these scary stories that were told, and rumors and legends were not true. What is the positive thing? Here's a, uh, the Army, some people say, oh, this was a secret project. The Army started publishing the results of the studies immediately. Um, fast forward through here a bit. Yeah, some of the things that, the way we study diseases today, one of the things I saw at Fort Detrick was the <coughs> BSL-4 lab, Biosafety Level 4 Laboratory. This is where they study the most dangerous diseases like Ebola. And if you've seen some of these movies where these people are in rubber suits hooked up to air and they're working on these terribly infectious things, all of those protocols were developed as a result of, of, of white coat. Um, I'm not finding my slide that I had. Uh, issues related to uh, 
Sandfly fever was one, rabbit fever, Q fever, eastern Ence uh, equine encephalitis, western equine encephalitis. There were about 20 different diseases for which they either learned more about them, were able to develop treatments, uh, were able to prove that certain treatments worked. That was the fruit, good fruit. So that's why we want to recognize those who are here today, Bob Abrahamson and Jerry Hart and Lloyd Clapp. You guys, come up here, please. Like all three of you. Because I want to hear a bit from you guys and what your experience was like. Yeah, just say a little bit about what you were, you were involved and uh, uh, what kind of things you participated in. I was there from 60 to 62. Uh, I was married three years when I was in the service, but when I got to Fort Dietrich, I was assigned to building 170. Unfortunately for me, that was the research and histology pathology department. So Fred Talley <clears throat> came to me one day, we, we kept a good clean building, he says, they called me Abe, Abe uh, would you like to become one of our technicians? I said, well, I think I would like to try that. What we did, we prepared this slide for the leading pathologist in the country who were studying these diseases. And uh, I'll tell you, when you cut one of those slides, um, there's no scratches on them. I mean, it has to be done. Because you didn't, you might get reprimanded for it. But anyway, I enjoyed it, and they asked me to stay on after my time was up to, as a technician. And my wife and I decided we wanted to go back home. And uh, so that's where we ended up. But I really enjoyed Fort Dietrich. Dr. DiMazzo, we babysat part of their family. Uh, he had, I think there's 11 kids in that family, I believe, his brothers and sisters. Ray was a pharmacist. Uh, Herb was a film a doctor. And uh, was, you know, Frank was a, was a medical doctor. And they had a sister who was a nurse. But anyway, we used to babysat their kids, so we got really close to DiMazzo's and still talked to Dr. Frank quite regularly. And uh, he, he was a real fan of white coats and really took care of us. My name is Lloyd Clapp, and I was in the white coat operation uh, in 72 to 74. My draft number was 43, so I really didn't have a choice whether or not I could get, go in the Army because I soon got a letter. And we met the representatives in San Antonio, Texas, and they said, would you like to come up and help us and volunteer for the program? And, you know, the the, we really didn't know what we were getting into as such. It was told about the program, but had no idea of what it was going to involve. And when we got up there at Fort Dietrich, Maryland, it was a, a very organized and uh, clean operation and a uh, very good atmosphere here up there. And I was uh, chosen to be what they call a medical illustrator. I had been taking industrial arts and I'd taken drafting quite a bit and so they needed someone to help develop these charts for the doctors from all their tests and everything. So my job along with another gentleman were to take all these tests and put them in graphs and charts and then have a five, uh, photograph and if you look in the American medical journals and, and other medical uh, publications you'll see many of our charts that our friend and I did up there through the 72, 74 era. And at that point, I was, uh, met my wife during there, that operation, and we got married. And her brother, Dan, was uh, also in the White Coats, and he participated in the sand fly fever testing. And so uh, he survived, and he now lives in Loma Linda. So the program was a very good one, and many of you may know Pastor Ron Ray. Uh, he and I were in the White Coats together, and he took our apartment when we moved away. He stayed away there and went to Columbia Union College at that time and finished up his ministerial. Now, sandfly fever is one of these interesting things that comes upon you very quick and it becomes very disorienting. So they gave that to some of the NASA astronauts as they were preparing. They wanted to see what will happen uh, if you're up in space and you get sick and you get disoriented. Uh, and how can we tell from exposure, 
how long it'll take before it breaks out. And they had these tests put in place. They were able to figure out, okay, we can know this far in advance if you're going to get it or not. Well, if you remember Apollo 13, and they had the one astronaut who had been exposed to measles, and they thought for sure he was going to get come down with it so he was grounded. Well, it was the white coat experiments that led them to make that conclusion, even if they were wrong in his case. So, Jerry? Well, you know, I've heard of so many servicemen who, who got a letter saying, you know, greetings, you, <laughs> you've been chosen to serve in the military. I didn't get that. Uh, I was married. My, my wife and I lived down in the Oklahoma Panhandle, and we are originally from Stillwell over here, and uh, she wanted to subscribe to the Stillwell newspaper there this particular evening we got we after I got off work we got the mail and the paper happened to be in there and as we were going to Guyman which is 18 miles from where we lived there was a list of uh, from the selective service in there, and my name was in there. And she bawled her eyes out from, from there all the way to town. And uh, my oldest brother lived there at Diamond, and we, we stopped in to see them and, and to break the news. But you know, I didn't know about the 1A old classification. I went in this 1A. And I went to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. <laughs> well, uh, when uh, when we got to our uh, permanent uh, basic training area. You know, we got oriented, orientation, I mean, and, and uh, the question was asked if anybody had any questions. And I raised my hand and I said, yeah, when can I see the chaplain? So I went to see the chaplain the first thing the next morning and explained what my situation was. And uh, he said, they will not issue you a rifle. But you know, I did I did all the other training with the troops. This was, I went in November 7 of 62 and got out in 64. And uh, I, I did all the training with, with the troops except for the rifle. And, uh, and then, uh, come Christmas break, I got my orders to go to Fort Sam. And, uh, but, you know, and then, then when I got to Maryland, I, I learned about this white coat deal. And I said, yeah, I'll go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked at Building 1040, and we had research animals there, mostly monkeys. And we would do tests. We would run tests. And, and we had three horses, I think. And we had several, well, more than several. We had quite a group of dogs, beagles. The reason they used beagles was because of their big ears. And, and they could uh, tattoo, <coughs> they would tattoo their ears. And, uh, but, I don't want to take any more time. But. No, th thanks each of you. Uh, you want to have something to add about? I was going to say, when you point out, some of these guys really got sick. I mean, they oh, were yeah. really sick. And they didn't know if they were going to survive or not. You know, they were so sick. But, but the three of us, evidently, were in positions where 
we were needed for other duties rather than the testing because you know the lab you know, they can test the lab tech overnight you know so so evidently Boyd can be replaced and evidently the animals had to have special care so yeah. speaking of speaking of that Bob uh, the group I was in uh, started medication right away and we didn't get sick but now the first group they wasn't going to start medication until they started showing symptoms. And some of them, yeah, I read, they really got sick. Yeah, just because these were not fatal diseases doesn't mean that those guys who got it did not get very sick and very miserable. And uh, yeah, we've heard some of their stories too. So it was a real sacrifice that they did put themselves through. <laughs> yeah, we, we were exposed to rabbit fever, which you mentioned. Okay, you got the rabbit fever. Yeah. And what did that feel like? <laughs> well, I couldn't, I couldn't tell any difference because uh, we started medication, okay. my group started medication uh, as soon as we were inoculated with it. Yeah, and that's one of the other things they wanted to find is, you know, at what point is it most effective to give uh, the uh, medication after exposure? Well, now there's, well, the White Coats have had a number of reunions over the years at Fort Detrick, and you didn't get to, did you get to any of those reunions? No. no. And at one of them, the army and the church gave a presentation to all the White Coats, which you missed out on, but not today. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, we are here today, and that was really Bob's initial call to me. He says, you know, Jerry Hart never got the medals that everybody else did. Do you still have any of those? And as a matter of fact, I said, yeah, Art Walls, who's been the president of the White Coat Foundation, just sent me the box with all the last of them so that I can take it from here. And so I've got two for you. And this one says, United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases White Coat Program. 1954 to 1973. So this is the one that comes from the United States Army. And this one says Operation White Coat 1954-1973. This is the one that comes from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Other goodie bags. I got for each of them one of our coins from Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries. So, Jerry, thank you very much. We're so honored to have you and glad that we can honor you today here in front of your family and your congregation. Yeah, we're so honored. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob. Thank you. So I'll let these older guys sit down now. They need to get off their feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there is a memorial to the White Coats that is at the Frederick Church. Um, and they put that up. Well, do you, know, you remember what year that was? Uh, around 98, 99. 98 and 99. And so out in front of the church and the main street is there, there is a memorial. And then inside the church, they have a display of a lot of the memorabilia and so on. So, so that's one tangible marker. But even at Fort Detrick, in Crozier Hall, and Colonel Crozier was the one who was over the White Coat program most of for much of the later years, inside Crozier Hall, one of the things I saw was a big poster display about the White Coats. And uh, when I talked to the commander, he said, oh yeah, we, we remember every day their legacy, and we are so grateful for what they have done. Uh, it's funny how the church sometimes forgets. How many of you knew the White Coat story? Not, not a whole lot. Um, but when I, a couple years ago, I went to the Army's Bioethics Conference at Walter Reed Bethesda. 
one of my Army buddies was the uh, Army's bioethicist, and they pick a chaplain every couple of years to get trained in bioethics and have that role for the Army. And he invited me to come to the Army's bioethics conference. And I did, and they had lots of presentations from researchers, and half of them, in their papers, recognized the white coats and the role that they did. And I was like, wow. And I said, you know, I said to my friend, I could do a presentation on that. So the next year, I was back at the Army Bioethics Conference uh, giving a presentation about Operation White Coat. You know, there's so much of our Adventist history that is so rich that we have made so much of a contribution. Um, in the field of chaplaincy, the contributions of our Adventist chaplains are very extensive. Uh, Bob Mole, who wrote the book about the White Coats, when he was a chaplain in Vietnam, he got the idea, it's like, we have all these Vietnamese folks here. How do we understand even who the people are that we're fighting alongside or we're fighting? What motivates them? What are their values? He said, maybe I as a chaplain should try to understand their religious worldview, and maybe that will help us relate better to them. So he created what today we call religious area analysis a basic tool that the chaplain brings to the command, not just to do religious services, but also as a religious expert to help the commander understand what are the religious issues in the battlefield or in his own unit. And it was the Seventh-day Adventist chaplain who created that. Another Adventist chaplain, Dick Stenbachen, he was an army chaplain for 30 years, became colonel, became director of Adventist chaplaincy ministries. He was the one who inspired me to be an army chaplain. Uh, he came to Broadview Academy in 1977 when I was a student, and it was right after the draft ended, so he wanted to talk to us about the, what it means to volunteer for the Army, and he mentioned chaplains. And I raised my hand at the end of Espers and said, so what does it take to be an Army chaplain? And he said, first you have to be a pastor, then we have to pick you. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> And that was a response of all my classmates that they thought it was uh, I was being blown off, but no, I was being inspired. And, uh, Dick, as a chaplain, he created a family life training chaplain for the Army. He saw that our, the chaplains needed more training in family counseling. So he set up a program when he was working in the Pentagon for selecting certain chaplains to get a degree in marriage and family ther therapy and to be certified as marriage and family counselors. And I was with Dick a couple of years ago at Fort Hood, which is the training center, where all these chaplains come to get this. And they have a counseling center there where families on post could come to get counseled, and then they get their degree from Central Texas A&M University, and that's going strong now. And Dick had his tears in his eyes as he saw the legacy of it. Dick also had this other unique gift he does a lot of one-man plays. Some of you might have seen him at a camp meeting or something. He started out, he was a chaplain at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, and the Protestant women of the chapel, uh, the women's group, came to him and said, Chaplain, we need something different for a Christmas program this year. So he dressed up as a shepherd, and he told the Christmas story from the perspective of a shepherd out in the field. And from there, he started doing stories of other Bible characters. And then he did one where he combined the stories of Roman centurions uh, in the Gospels into a single character. And he has like three sets of Roman armor in his house that we've seen. And he comes out dressed fully in that. Well, then he started doing some military ones. So he wears a World War I uniform and he tells the story of the Canadian doctor who wrote the poem in Flanders Fields. He wears the uniform of a World War II sergeant, and he tells about the sinking of the UST Dorchester, which was a troop ship that was sunk by a German, German torpedo on its way to Greenland, and there were four chaplains on board, two Protestants, a Catholic, and a Jew. And those four men gave their life vests to the soldiers, helped them, and went down with the ship praying together, a great symbol of the interfaith unity that the Chaplain Corps has and the focus on giving soldiers. Uh, Dick tells the story of uh, Father Capon, who was a Catholic priest in the Korean War. He was a POW in China, 
and he stole food from his captors to give to his men. When they'd come back from torture, he would give them support and nurture, and they bounced back, and they were more resilient under torture because of their chaplain. In their indoctrination centers, se sessions, when they're trying to be re-educated, Chaplain Capon would get up and argue philosophy and contradict very graciously everything that uh, the captors were trying to say. And the Koreans knew that this man was undermining, this one chaplain was undermining everything they did. <coughs> so they locked him in a box and starved him to death. And Dick tells that story from the perspective of one of the guys, soldiers, uh, digging his grave and burying him. Dick tells the story of a Lutheran chaplain, Henry Garricky, who was in Germany at World War II, and because he spoke German, they gave him a new assignment. They said, you're going to be chaplain at Nuremberg, and you're going to be pastor to the Nazi war crimes defendants. Your congregation is now Hermann Goering, Albert Speer, Jodl, and all these other top Nazis. And over the next, over the course of those trials, he got to know all of them. And he was pastor to them. And when he was going to get sent home, all these Nazis wrote a letter to his wife. And I've seen the original at the Lutheran Church Missouri headquarters in St. Louis. And they said, Dear Mrs. Garricky, we know that you wanted your husband back. And it's been a long war for all of us. But we pray that you let him stay just a little longer until the end of, our, of this whole process. Because he's been a pastor to us. He's brought some of us back to Christ. He's given us communion. He's treated us with dignity and respect. And we all love this man. Wow, what a testament. And a couple of years ago, the Army Chief of Chaplains, uh, Paul Hurley, wanted to focus the Chaplain Corps on what it means to be a chaplain. What is our identity as chaplains serving our soldiers? You know, this chaplain that you met, he wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but he was going to go to bat for you and for your convictions. Because that's our job as chaplains, to protect the religious liberty rights of all of our soldiers. So Chaplain Hurley said, I want to get the whole chaplain corps together, and I'm going to have some large trainings, and I'm going to talk to them about what it means to be a chaplain. And I want Dick Stenbach to help me. So the first day, he would give about a 20-minute talk, and then Dick would come in, hunched over with a mustache and... Uh, Brian this very old man and a cane, and he would tell that story of the sinking of the Dorchester. And all these chaplains, I saw it at Fort Hood, there were like 200 chaplains and chaplain assistants, and they all crowded around him afterwards and wanted their picture with him, and they thought it was, he was telling his own story. The next day, Chaplain Hurley gives, gives a little another talk, and then Dick comes in ramrod straight, playing the role of this chaplain at World War, uh, at the Nuremberg, and the guys realized, oh, wait a second. He's an actor. <laughs> that's, one, that's another chaplain's influence. Uh, another Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, uh, Jonathan McGraw. He's our senior army chaplain right now. He is director of strategic initiatives at the Office of the Chief of Chaplains. His job is to respond to whatever the chief thinks are creative or are strategic needs for the chaplaincy. Where do we need to go down the road? And in my last assignment with the Army Reserve for two years, I got to work as part of his team at the Pentagon, which was really cool, working for a fellow Adventist, doing all this creative stuff. So that's the person that was put in charge of the future of the chaplaincy and these strategic issues, a Seventh-day Adventist who, when he was a major, he created a program now called Strong Bonds of marriage retreats for single soldiers on marriage prep, for uh, young couples, for marriage enrichment, because the Army chaplaincy was concerned about the divorce rate, and they said, we need to do something that will impact that, and they picked this, and this program of the Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, which is now one of the big programs being used everywhere in the army by every single chaplain. One of the things we were tasked with, General Milley, the chief of staff, was concerned about suicide among general officers. One GO killed himself right after pinning on his third star. And I was like, why? And we were tasked with coming up with a program to provide pastoral care 
for our senior leaders and how can we better equip our chaplains not just to be doing Bible studies with 18 year old soldiers but how can they advise and pastor and build relationships with our most senior leaders who are the most isolated and Chaplain McGraw was given that responsibility so that's just the army uh, the Navy of course we had this guy who was once a very cocky young kid oh I've seen sermons of him back in the 70s a guy named Barry Black he had this big black Afro and he was cocky as a preacher. Well, he rose to be two-star admiral, chief of chaplains for the United States Navy, and now has been for the past 20 years chaplain of the United States Senate, and one of the most respected chaplains of any denomination. What a lot of people don't realize is when he was chief of chaplains for the Navy, his deputy chief of chaplains, one star, rear admiral, lower half, was Daryl Bigger another Seventh-day Adventist, professor of theology at Walla Walla University for many, many years. Daryl served for 30 years in the Navy Reserve, became that, got that one star, and on September 11, 2001, he was the only senior chaplain at the Pentagon, and he was responsible for coordinating the chaplain response to those injured for the first couple of days till the Army took that over. A couple years ago, I had reached out to him. Oh, about nine years ago, I was faced with a rash of suicides in my National Guard unit. And I was asked to write an article about the suicide issue today. And I asked Daryl about it, and he said in his 30 years in the Navy chaplains that he never had a single sailor die by suicide, and he never did a suicide intervention. In 2017, January of that year, I had five suicides in one infantry brigade three in one battalion down in the Rio Grande Valley. And I went down there and my commander and sergeant major said to me, Chaplain, what is it? We brought this unit back and forth to combat in Iraq and Afghanistan three times. Everybody's come home alive. Everybody's come home with a combat infantryman's badge, a CIB, and we, only, and we lose them to crime, traffic accidents, to suicide. Six months later, that battalion commander died by suicide too. So the challenges faced by our military members today are unique. We've been at war for 18 years. We forget it. We don't hear our politicians talking about it much. It doesn't come up in the debates in the last couple presidential elections. Most Americans have nobody in, the, in their family in the military today. My father was in the Air Force. I had an uncle in the Navy, another uncle in the Army, another uncle in the Air Force, lots of cousins. I did 20 years Army. My brother was in the Army. Another brother was in the Air Force. My sister married a Vietnam vet who then continued and, uh, uh, and retired. She has two sons. One is a first sergeant, dental assistant in Germany. The other just got selected for E8. Uh, he's NCOIC for one of the White House communication teams that goes out and does all the president's communication gear when he travels. Um, my two nephews, one has had six combat deployments, the other has had seven. And they're not even 40 years old. They're both coming up to the 20 year mark. Vietnam, nobody went to war six times, seven times in Vietnam. My grandfather in the Civil War, he went off in 1862, came back in 1865, he was gone for three years. Uh, you know, World War II, they were gone for three years, maybe. But imagine that, having seven combat deployments, seven years away from home. And now, look at the cover of Time Magazine this week, has different faces of different Marines, all who were born after 9-11, all now in basic training, all going to fight on the same battlefields that their parents fought on. And we have chaplains there. Chaplain Jose Ricardo Merchan, he just landed in Afghanistan a few days ago from the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, and one of my cousins, a West Point grad, patch pilot, is one of his company commanders in his battalion. We have one of our conference presidents, Kevin Miller, president of the Alaska Conference, is a chaplain in the Alaska National Guard, and he's now deployed to Ukraine. Uh, another one of our chaplains who was an enlisted chaplain assistant with me on my deployment, uh, he just got back from a deployment to uh, uh, Latvia and Romania. 
uh, we have chaplains at sea. One of our Seventh-day Adventist chaplains, uh, uh, Mike Hackinson, is over all of the chaplains of the Pacific Fleet. Very high responsibility. So I ask you both to, this, if we come upon this Veterans Day, say thanks indeed for the veterans who have served. How many other veterans do we have in the congregation? Thank you for your service. So we thank you for your service. Um, and we also pray and remember those who are still in harm's way, those who are still serving, those who are serving our soldiers. I was in Germany this year. We have a retreat every year for our Adventist service members and their families in Germany, and I've been able to go do that the last couple of years. And it's such a wonderful time uh, to see them. My boss goes to Okinawa and Korea to see, see our folks deployed uh, to those areas. We have, some, we have Adventist services on a lot of bases, Lackland Air Force Base. I preached there a few months ago. We had like 100 people at that service. Only about 10% of them were Seventh-day Adventists. The others, they got to bring their battle buddy along, and others came just because, hey, it's a church service, free food, something different than the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stuff. So please keep all of this service in your prayers. Any questions that anybody has? We've dumped a lot on you this morning, but... Okay, and I, I saw, I, I think, three hands of veterans. You, three guys come up. Come up here, in, in the back. I'm going to give you guys one of my coins, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you too for the spouses. Man, those of you who are, had to go through this with, with, with your husbands or, uh, or hear war stories forever. Oh, my poor <laughs> wife. <laughs> but we can't forget the support of the family. How many of you have family members that are serving currently? Even more of you. So know that we as a church are here for them. Our chaplains are here. We have a webpage, adventistsinuniform.org, where service members and veterans can register, and that's where they can request materials from us, you know, a little Bible kit that we can send out. Um, uh, they can stay in communication with us. If they want to find out where there's an Adventist service or an Adventist chaplain, we can connect them, um, and we're here to support. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we give you